Hello there and good evening. My name is Lisa Passmore and I'm presenting the Bay OK series this evening. Uh, excuse the photo there, that was taken um, a few years ago before children, so um, a few differences now. Okay, so the reason that we're here tonight is because water quality management monitoring indicates that the health of the Geograph Bay could be at risk if nutrients from it continue, if nutrients continue to enter the Bay Area. Um, what nutrients are we talking about? Well, I'm talking about fertilizers and manures, things that we put on our gardens. Where do they go? Well, in a unimproved sandy soil situation they do end up leaching through the soil and end up in our waterways and then ultimately into the geograph bay so this doesn't need to happen we need to look at how we can have beautiful gardens but be responsible and protect our bay so the very first step is to look at how we can you know design some of these principles into our gardens and we're going to look at garden design tips tonight um, and all the elements all the elements of good garden design come into play in your bay okay garden so we'll be looking at those as well we'll be looking at form we'll be looking at function space balance as well as color and texture now before we go on let's just do a spot of housekeeping can you all hear me um, so hopefully you can hear me, but I can't hear you. So, um, and should tonight, if, if there's any issues at all with internet, if there's some dropout, please stay with us and we'll get things back up and running as soon as we can. There will be a and a session at the end of the presentation, but feel free to fire any questions you have um, using the Q&A button and do that at any time through the presentation. Uh, and then we'll, talk about those at the end of the session. Um, there will also be an evaluation at the, end of the at the end of the session. So stay online and you'll be redirected to the link where you can complete a survey and give us your feedback as well. Okay. So Bay OK Gardens, we're looking at promoting beautiful, healthy gardens, but also having a positive impact on the environment. A Bay OK garden minimises that nutrient leaching. It supports local diversity and biodiversity, providing a refuge for native animals. By following Bay OK garden principles, you can protect our rivers, our wetlands and Geograph Bay's marine environment. So before you launch into putting plants in the ground, there's a few steps we're going to look at. And very importantly, take a step back and look at your garden area. And in fact, when you're planning your garden, it's a really good idea to get this information onto paper. So get some graph paper in the daylight and head out with a tape measure and measure up the garden area. I always like to start with those fixed structures. So I would start with the house, measure up the house to scale, um, a, a scale of one to 100, one centimetre on your page, equivalent to a metre or 100 centimetres in the garden is a good scale for most, for most garden areas. Um, so use that scale on your graph paper, measure from the house, measure in the doors and the windows and any pillars and openings and projections. Um, these are also going to give you some cues when you come to planting and positioning things, but also doors and windows, particularly key windows of your house, provide you with a vista out to the garden so we need to consider those you know think about think about the rooms in your house that you spend the most time you know if you're a, a, a have a busy family then maybe the view from the kitchen sink might be important uh, if you work from home perhaps the view out of your study window or your living room so think about those views as well and then walk around your property and as you're doing tune into all your senses think about um, the wind flow think about the breezes in your hair think about what you can hear beyond your garden 
Can you hear street noise, traffic noise, industry noise, um, or is there bird song? So think about all those things as well and what you can use your garden to, to mitigate or enhance. Look at the views, look at the views beyond your garden. Do you have sea views or views of trees um, that you want to connect to and enhance and bring into your garden space? Um, or likewise, do you have things you want to block out? So make note of all of, all of these, measuring in all those fixed structures, starting with the building, out to the boundaries or the fence line, measuring in garden paths and any trees or shrubs that you're going to keep and utilise in the space. So having a really good plan to start with. Um, looking at the North Point and, you know, you have some of the most beautiful countryside in the world um, at your back door there. So um, looking at drawing in those elements where you can. We call this borrowed landscape when we're looking at the gardens beyond our garden, things that we want to connect with or things we might need to screen out. So have a look at your borrowed landscape as well. Very importantly, make a note on your plan of the North Point. Um, because that has a big impact on the kinds of plants that you'll need to, that you want to grow and where those plants are going to grow best on your property. So you need that information, that scale, that north point, those fixed structures. Um, and then you can start to, start to dream, start to look at some images of gardens that inspire you because your Bay OK garden can be inspired by gardens from anywhere in the world. And the trick will be in adapting the appropriate plants to suit the look, the style, the theme that you want to create in your own garden. So the sky's the limit, literally any style or theme. And when you're looking at your garden area, don't forget the verge. You know, this is, this is underutilised space. If we incorporate the verge in our garden planning, particularly for our front garden areas, we can make it feel like we've got a lot more real estate than perhaps we, we do. Um, and we can also flow our garden through and create these nature corridors, wildlife havens um, by utilising that verge. And this is a beautiful image from Sustainable Outdoors. And you can see um, in the image at the very front near the road, we've got some ground cover Eremophila. Um, behind that, some, um, some Luca Phyta with the silvery white foliage. And those colours are really useful on the verge areas because they glow under headlight, under street light. So they illuminate your driveway, which is kind of handy. Um, plus they look really, really great um, at any time of day or night. And by incorporating uh, lots of diverse plants, we can, we can have something there for the birds, for the insects, the butterflies, um, create food and, and, and safe havens for all, all creatures. And the great thing about utilising native plants, and we can use native plants to fit that theme or style for any style of garden, whether it's a, a feng shui, Japanese look, whether it's formal, Mediterranean, you could use a Bay OK water wise native plant to suit that look. It's just about being creative and about getting some good information and good advice. And when we do plant at our verges like this, um, you know, we, we you know, you don't need to have lawn there. Uh, you can do away with the lawn completely. And I, I think that's a really good use of a verge area. Having a lawn on a verge to me is a, a waste of water, a waste of resources. And it's not as if we're going to send our little ones out to the edge of the road to go and play. So planting out the verge with ground covers with an assortment of plants just makes sense. The next really important thing to consider is what kind of soil do you have? And maybe, maybe I'm being a bit generous using the word soil. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with something that's not too dissimilar to beach sand, perhaps. And, you know, any plant, even a, a Bay OK water wise native plant planted directly into sand is not going to thrive. 
nothing is really going to thrive in sand. And when you look at the plants in the garden centre, you'll see that they're growing in this beautiful mix of, of potting mix. They're not growing in sand. So we put our plants from the nursery into pure sand. They kind of shrink and eventually they just die. So it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of all those resources. So the first step is to look at the soil that you're dealing with or the sand that you're dealing with. And we need to do some things to improve that, to enable those plants to thrive. So when we look at sand, uh, silt, clay, soil type mixes, um, you know, different components, different components of soil serve different functions. So whilst I give sand a bad rap, sand is an important component of a good soil mix. Sand does provide micro pores of air in the soil and we need oxygen in the soil sand does provide good drainage sometimes too good it's not very good at hanging on to nutrient or hanging on to water but it does drain freely so sand in conjunction with other things is is a component of of good soil um, silt uh, and sand is the largest particle um, then we've got silt is a, a finer particle of, of um, um, soil texture, um, broken down organic material, um, and it's, it's, it's quite fine. And then clay, which most of your gardens probably don't have a lot of clay in there, but clay is finer again, and almost kind of, if we would look at it, clay under the microscope as shown in these images there, clay would be much, much smaller than the other particles and is more kind of flake-like in its formation. Um, and clay, you know, whilst it doesn't drain very well on its own it does have higher nutrient content it does have higher moisture content so in conjunction our best hope in in gardens particularly starting starting with a sandy soil is to create a sandy loam that's our our best that's our ambition that's our best hope and the way that you can test your soil is to do a simple test we call it the jar test where you take a, a clean empty jar with a well-fitted lid half fill that jar with a sample of your soil and preferably take it down below 10 centimeters and pick out any rock and and stick and bark that might be there so you're getting a, a true sample of the soil um, so half fill the jar with your soil then top it up with water and then give it a really really vigorous shake and what that is designed to do is to have the layers settle out sand being the heaviest is at the bottom silt follows that and then clay if there's clay sitting on top and then by working out the percentage ratio of those elements you can get a sense of what soil you're dealing with and that's the very first step before we choose our plants and and any of that um, the soil triangle um, is is wonderful too and that helps you figure out exactly based on those percentages what you're dealing with the holy grail of soils is loam loam is 40 percent sand 40% silt and 20% clay, roughly. Um, and that is a perfect, perfect ratio for growing plants. But in Perth, sandy loam is pretty jolly good. And the more you garden and the more you improve your soils with compost and adding clay, if you don't have clay present, and you can buy it by the bag to mix in with the soil improver or the compost in with your sandy mix to create beautiful dirt. Okay, so that's something we need to keep in mind and there's lots of information available on that there's an example of the beautiful loam um, which is is where you'll get with this with the soil improving and adding clay so then we can look at some design principles and all the elements of good design come into play here we're going to be looking at um, how we can structure the space and you know Talking about lawn before on verges, you know, lawn is also something in your broader garden areas that needs to be a well considered planned element. You know, how much lawn in your garden do you actually need? Is it for play? Is it for sport? Or is it just for aesthetics? Because if you're not actually using it, 
then we've got plenty of great ground covers that will do the job or the, give you the look if it's not an area that you're kicking a ball around on or sending children to play on. So, you know, looking at some alternatives there, such as some low growing ground covers. And we've got some samples here on the screen of some beautiful ground covers that will do a really good job. And the thing I love about these ground covers too is that you get really good bang for your buck, if you like. Um, one ground cover, like a Grevillea Jinjin gem, for example, is going to cover a couple of, couple of metres, two metres of area. So you're getting a lot of greenery, a lot of coverage with just one plant. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at pathways and things, again, you know, we don't need to have a lawn as a pathway if it's for access. Think about stepping stones, think about a chunky mulch um, and look at how you can, you know, play and create a rhythm. And in this image here, we've got a beautiful rhythm happening with the stepping stones, with the plants layering up in height from low to high as we move through the garden area. Think about the kinds of colours that you want in the garden, whether you want to have a colours, all the colours of the rainbow, or whether you want to have a bit of a scheme of colours. Keeping in mind as a general rule of thumb, if you want to attract birds into the garden, they're attracted by the hot colours. So they love the red and the orange and the gold. If you want to bring in the butterflies and the bees, then you want to bring in more pastel shades and mauves and whites and soft yellows. So, you know, think about what critters you want to, want to attract to your garden as well. Um, in our image here, we've got a beautiful grass tree and the grass tree um, also provides habitat underneath. And I've seen a few quenders um, making homes underneath the skirts of these grass trees. So um, you don't have to up prune those. You can leave them natural and providing a bit of a, a haven sanctuary there as well. Incorporate some prickly plants too um, to provide small animals and birds with safe places. And when we have pathways like this that kind of disappear around the corner, there is also that sense of, of intrigue and mystery where you can't see where all the garden is or where a path is going. So it, it draws you into the space and has you want to explore and wander through. And I think that's a really nice thing to aspire to in a garden. And here we've got a, a nice contemporary Australian look um, in the garden. And we've got lots of lovely elements. We've got the grass trees providing drama and interest. We've got the pops of colour from the kangaroo paws. The bench seat sort of draws your eye um, and, and to rest in that space. And the vertical posts arrest your view from what might be happening beyond, um, beyond that garden area. So there's some really lovely elements at play here as well as different textures and materials. You've got the gravel, um, the chunky bark and the stone with the dry creek bed and even a bridge. So there's lots of really um, appealing elements in this design. Um, here we've got sort of morning light hitting the, the garden there and your eye is drawn through the garden, particularly the garden on the left with the silver leucophyta, the cushion bush. So having some elements in the garden that are repeated also give you that designer touch. Um, so re repetition of those elements in the space as well as the, the contrasting textures. A great thing about garden design, if you're thinking about it being as a, a living form of artwork, you know, it's, it's a painting that changes with the daylight, it changes with the breezes, moving with the breezes, um, it changes with the season. So it's a very movable feast. And plus it's, it's a garden that you might be able to also taste if you're growing edible plants or bush tucker plants and you can smell it as well. Smelling the, the sweet honey of the banksia or the grevillea flowers um, or the unusual smells of the of of the wattles and the aeromophila. So you can have all the senses at play, the touch of the grasses and the silky foliage of those plants. Um, and you can create some real drama. So here we've got an image of, of some clipped wastringia, clipped into balls. 
Um, and, you know, clipping plants is a wonderful therapeutic thing to do. It's very meditative to do trimming. Um, and this would create quite a formal look. So it depends on the kind of look that you're chasing. And I'm loving those um, dark leafed peppermints. The agonis uh, looks like a gonus burgundy there um, with that upper canopy. And notice how you can still see through. So you've got you've got the balls and then you've got space and then you've got canopy so you've got good sight line through and this is a kind of this is a really nice idea for public spaces for areas where you need visibility for vehicles along driveways as well um, and when you're looking at your your overall garden plan as well think about where you might be able to fit in things like rainwater tanks um, now rainwater tanks are wonderful at harvesting water at this time of year when there's an abundance of water uh, but that's not actually the time of year that your garden needs the, the water from the rainwater tank because it's already getting watered from the rain. But rainwater tanks harvesting and collecting water right now are a wonderful resource for tapping into or piping into the home and using that water to run washing machines, to flush toilets. It's a free resource um, that you can use rather than paying for mains or scheme water to wash and, and flush. So um, absolutely consider how you might use a, a rainwater tank on the property. And when you're looking at the garden, yes, don't forget that verge area and the sky is the limit there. We've got an area on this image where you could park a car, um, but you've also got a really stylish um, water-wise uh, verge area. Again, notice the chunky mulch and you'll see a lot of chunky mulch on these slides. And that's because chunky mulches are the most water wise mulches they make that water freely available to the soil below they are conserving soil moisture and they're moderating soil temperature um, whereas some of the finer mulches and you know if they've got the word compost in the name then the clue is it's probably not a very good mulch for the surface so the finer the finer mulches tend to mat together um, and prevent that water from flowing through so chunky is best um, and the tip is if it feels uncomfortable to walk on barefoot then it's probably a water wise mulch um, so considering with your gardens as well um, hydrozoning um, hydrozoning means basically designing your plant groupings based on their water needs, their collective water and maintenance needs. So when we're talking hydrozones, the, the, the primary hydrozone, the area that might need a bit of supplementary water over say summertime would be an area that and for me it's, it's the edible patch it's the veggie patch um, which isn't normally going to survive on twice a week watering you know your veggies just get uh, your lettuce gets bitter veggies bolt quickly so they do need that extra little bit of supplementary watering or consider some of those um, uh, wicking bed type scenarios that provide a reservoir of water to those um, herbs and vegetables which need more. So that would be your primary hydrozone. Your secondary hydrozone would include your lawn, would include your fruit trees and your ornamental plants, things that um, need the twice a week watering to keep them looking good. So primary hydrozone is going to take in, you're going to need to use your scheme water um, or other water sources to keep those areas looking good. And then we've got the minimal hydrozone, which is kind of where we all need to be looking for our gardens now and in the future. And the minimal hydrozone is those areas that only need just the minimal amount in the hottest part of the year and, and may not even need it, but um, the minimal amount to keep them alive. And we're talking verge areas, we're talking native gardens um, that are well established. So, and the crucial uh, element of all of that is doing your soil 
preparation first, really, really good soil prep with your compost, with your clay, then your minimal hydrozone is going to flourish. And you know, you might need to just water for the first three summers until that zone is established. So that's a little bit about hydrozones and it also ties in with the maintenance requirements of those areas. So the veggie patch, you know, we're going to need to visit it a bit more regularly. I'm out in my veggie patch, you know, morning and night, um, harvesting, checking, looking at them, um, checking on those things and switching most of them over to wicking beds, I have to say, because I love how that just provides that extra reservoir of, of moisture um, in the hotter parts of the day. Um, <clears throat> so. Here's another beautiful image um, of how you can have drama and colour in a contemporary look and utilising things like feature wall colours as well. And this would all fit into that minimal hydrozone category and still look fantastic. So when you're looking at Plant selection, so important to talk to your local horticulturalist, your local landscaper and check in with them, asking questions like, you know, how, how, how does this plant grow in my area? What conditions does it need? How big, how wide is it likely to grow? Because the thing we've found is that plant labels on those plants in the nursery they're printed over east and they're printed for the whole country. They don't create state specific labels. So we, you know, something that's gonna grow in full sun in Tasmania or in Melbourne uh, might not cope in full sun in Perth. We need to check that. And likewise, heights will vary. You know, plants in Queensland are gonna grow much bigger than we can ever hope them to get in Perth in a minimal hydrozone scenario, for example. So do your research first, selecting the plants that are appropriate to your soil type, to the aspect, um, to the elements, the climatic elements that might be affecting your garden. If you've got strong sea breezes coming through regularly, you know, you need to account for that and look at what plants are going to cope. If the sea breezes are salt laden, then you need to, there's another layer of information that you need to check when you're choosing your plants. So do your research first, talk to your local experts as well. And there are some great flyers that I'll show you soon on this demonstration. Um, some plants um, provide vertical interest and our next slide shows a beautiful woolly bush in the background on the left there. Um, it gives also that lovely tactile sensory experience. The foliage is so soft, you just wanna go and, and, and stroke it, it's just gorgeous. But it's also giving you foliage foil for plants in front and vertical interest in the garden. Kangaroo paws are one of my favourites for providing colour and for being bird attracting um, and grevilleas and other plants as well to provide food and nectar. Um, and looking at another image here, we've got the peppermints, which are indigenous in your area, the willow peppermints, the Agonis flexuosa. Um, we saw a purple leaf version a few slides ago. Here is the traditional green leaf version. So it's looking at some understory plants that will complement those. And I love that Dianella, that variegated Dianella with the white and green stripes. It's just fantastic for adding a bit of light um, in uh, what might be a dark area. Area. So light and drama, plus it's super easy to care for, um, beautiful blue flowers and edible berries. What more could you ask for? Um, the berries are for the birds, by the way. And in the foreground, there's some low spreading native ground covers. So you can look at so many different styles and themes, simple, contemporary, modern, native, habitat garden. Um, here you can see that beautiful chunky mulch again and some timber pavers and feature colour on the wall. And, and this is just one of the demonstration gardens that uh, Bay OK have been involved in that you can go and see. So check out that information as well. Um, you can see quite a, a formal look. So you can have the clipped hedges and the formal look but still be Bay OK water wise, fertilise wise. And here's a great contemporary image here. 
um, loving those um, sleepers, both vertical and horizontal lines there, the beautiful stone, natural stone, um, and the layered plantings. And we've got a bit of a grey theme happening here. So you can absolutely have a colour theme that you explore, which works so well in a contemporary scenario too. So it's very much about choosing the right plant for the right spot and having that information and doing your research. You can use a full range of plants from ground covers um, through to climbers, small, medium shrubs, um, and working with, I always work kind of from the low to high, but when I'm designing, I'm starting with the big elements. I'm starting with the trees first, and then I'm, kind of working in reverse from high um, down to low. So I'm thinking about with the trees, they're creating microclimate, they're creating shade, and they're going to impact on the plants around. So positioning those trees really carefully so that you're getting the benefit of the, of the display of the shade, but you're not creating cold, gloomy houses. So um, for that purpose I tend to put deciduous trees in the sort of northwestern quadrant of the property so that I'm getting valuable shade in summertime but as they lose their foliage in winter I've got more light coming through and warming warming the home so um, and evergreens are, I'll place elsewhere so I'm not getting um, too much shade in winter time there. Uh, when you're looking at your properties and driveways and verge areas, keep in mind the sight lines. You need to have good visibility pulling out of driveways and looking along verges. So generally verge plantings um, need to stay very low, um, of course under a street tree, but low and no mid-storey plantings there so you've got good visibility. Um, love this view again of the, the vertical interest and the, the ball clipped shapes. Um, so easy to do with that native rosemary. Um, and here we've got another image of a demonstration garden. You can get lots of inspiration from these and I encourage you to, to all go and have a look at these demonstration gardens and, you know, Take photos if you're allowed, get permission first, but take photos of things that appeal to you, things that inspire you. And, and likewise, when you're looking through garden magazines or, um, you know, Pinterest is a really good resource as well for garden images, you know, make a compilation of gardens that you like the look of. And, you know, when you're walking around a garden, again, tune into all your senses. You know, think about, you know, surfaces and textures and how do those steps feel what are you picking up in that garden can you smell things can you hear things what are the textures around you as you're brushing past and I deliberately like to make pathways the secondary pathways that is um, deliberately narrow and lined with aromatic shrubs so as you're brushing against them you're getting that aromatic experience from things like lemon scented darwinia, um, eremophila, native daphne, the philotheca, there's some amazing plants that you can incorporate so um, you know get out there and touch and feel and smell and and write down things that, that that really appeal to you, write down combinations of plants that look really good together as well. So jot that information down. I love this contrast here of the grassy lamandra that we can see in the, the foreground of both those images. It kind of echoes the, the grassy form of the grass tree and the colours connect with the new growth of that gorgeous little eucalypt, which looks a bit like a kulaba type tree there. So that, that yellow new growth connecting with the lamandra and then all kind of bouncing off the, the silvery texture of the Grevillea there, the Grevillea Thelmaniana um, gilt dragon looks just stunning with those contrasts. So looking at contrasting those textures and things together and then the clipped forms for drama and interest. So much you can do. It's very exciting. And there's no space too small. So when you've got a bit of wall, you can, and, and I love this bit of Rio mesh framed up 
uh, on the wall and that's supporting a, a native climbing plant. Um, and as that will fill out, you'll see less and less of the mesh and more foliage uh, and flowers. Or using, um, you know, creating a sort of uh, a turret here with a, an upright um, structure, uh, which looks really, really good as well with the rock nearby and the westringias and the kangaroo paws. So. Uh, lots and lots of scope. So don't be afraid of experimenting with colour, um, with form and, and with making structures for your plants to, to grow on. Um, here again, some beautiful verge examples there and I love again that, that Eremophila, Eremophila um, glabra cowberry carpet there on the edge of the road, um, just glowing under the sunlight there um, and providing a really nice foliage contrast to the kangaroo paw and then the agonis, the, the willow peppermint in the background. And how striking is that black trunk of the grass tree with the grey and the yellow of the grey cotton heads in front. So the greys and the greens um, and that amazing black trunk. Um, so you know we can look at both foliage, foliage colour and floral show and we can create year-round interest if we look at all those elements. So um, think about which seasons of the year that you want to see colour in. If it's a pool garden, then perhaps spring and summer is when you want your floral display. Maybe you want something all year round, in which case, you know, jot down the flowering seasons of the plants you're thinking of using. So you can ensure you've got something happening, something flowering in every season of the year. But also by looking at the foliage textures and contrasting those foliage um, forms together, you can get that drama and that interest all year round. And some foliage is also really colourful. Um, so there's lots of sculptural um, foliage you can also incorporate there. Um, so you could have four seasons if you're thinking about the traditional calendar or perhaps you might look to the six seasons of the Aboriginal calendar um, and be informed by the different plants um, that we can have in those. In, in all those seasons. And then by incorporating some sculptural elements in the garden, and perhaps with a cute dog at the same time, um, <laughs> you can have that drama, have that interest, have something looking good all year round. Um, and remember that native gardens support local biodiversity and will require a minimal amount of fertiliser and water. The key is in having a diversity of plant species and lots of places for all creatures to hide or nest or have a drink of water. So keep all those things in mind. I mentioned the garden guides. There's some really great resources for you that are available on the website. Um, some of the garden guides, they look like this. We've got garden guides for established gardens, garden guides for brand new gardens. So if you've got a blank canvas and you need some good information, then, then head there first and have a, have a look at those guides. Um, and it's written specifically for the geograph catchment and specifically for those people that are planning um, a new garden or enhancing an existing garden. So really good companion, companion guide for you. Do check out the demonstration gardens. There are eight, uh, sorry, seven, <laughs> seven gardens. I've just made one up. Seven demonstration gardens and verge gardens that have been developed in your area all through Bustleton and Dunsborough for inspiration to demonstrate what is possible, what you can achieve in your own garden. And these are great things to look at and get that all important inspiration and those ideas. Um, so look, there's another link that you can head to to look at the demonstration gardens and, and go visit those locations. Um, it also lists out um, lists of the plant species that have been used in those demonstration gardens. So I reckon it'd be kind of fun to take that plant list along and tick them off tick them off as you find them, kind of like a treasure hunt in each of those gardens that you're visiting. And I'm sure you will find some firm favourites when you're looking at these beautiful gardens. Uh, so just um, looking back there, we have also some sample plans for you. So um, there's a 
range of four different plans and I've just got a little snapshot of one of them um, here. Um, this is from the Astartia garden. So you can actually look at how a garden designer has put this garden together with those different plant elements and it gives you a sense of scale as well. So you can get some really good ideas from this with regards to, um, and we've got both the elevation view, so looking at the garden front on, and then that plan view, which is kind of like a bird's eye view, um, hovering over the garden. And you'll notice that the plants are drawn at their mature width, and that's the secret to spacing out plants appropriately when you're designing your garden. It's drawing those things at mature width so we can get the correct spacing. You can see how big things are gonna grow and you can get a sense of the layering that'll occur with planting under a tree or planting around shrubs. So that is just crucial to, to do that. And that's why we need to measure up our garden areas first so you know on your graph paper what space you're dealing with. Notice as well when we're looking at these garden designs that there is balance. There is balance there between the planted areas and the open areas. And that's crucial too for garden design. If it's all planted, it's a bit of a jungle and your eye doesn't know where to, to rest. You're darting all over the place. So we, we need that balance. And if it's all space, all open area, well, it's probably an oval, not a garden. So we need the balance between the two things to make the garden design work. And those spaces, you know, they don't have to be a circle of lawn. It can be ground cover, it can be gravel, it can be mulch even to have that space within the garden. And we can make sense of it with a bench seat, with a piece of sculpture, um, tie all those elements in a bird bath for the birds. So some really good ideas. Here's some, some more um, images for you of some of the plans that you can download. And I, you can only just see a section of those. So absolutely head over to the website and download those and, and study those. And you'll notice that there's, there's four different designs and they all explore different themes. So there will be something there for everyone from the relaxed, um, circular inspired to the linear, uh, more modern, contemporary or formal look. Um, and here we've got the more natural look as well um, with a bit of symmetry. So there's, there's lots of really good uh, information there and they've been drawn up by landscape architects. So um, some great information and plant listing there. So absolutely have a look at those. Uh, there is also for you a resource kit, the Geograph Gardeners Resource Kit, supporting Bay OK Gardening, sustainable gardening practices. These resources will help you nurture your soil, use fertiliser responsibly, use water efficiently, grow local native species and encourage biodiversity in your garden. So some really good information there. And in fact, you know, if you're doing the right soil prep and choosing the correct plants, you shouldn't actually need to use too much fertiliser at all. It's all about healthy soil and healthy soil feeds plants, feeds plants for you. We don't need to add anything extra. So resources there available for you. A healthy bay garden begins in your own backyard. So on that note, we're now opening up the floor to Q&A. So your questions and I will answer those. Um, so hopefully you've been typing away and sending your questions in because I'm really keen to, to answer those for you. Okay. So our first question is, should you test, and I'm thinking that must be soil, in multiple places in your garden? Really good question. So, if you feel that you have different kinds of soils across the site, if it's a big block, if it's been gardened on before, then perhaps, yes, do a couple of tests to ascertain that. But if it's a new site and you're dealing with sand, it's going to be sand everywhere. So, but that's a really good question. So have a look at your site and, and make that judgment call. Um, what is the name of the white verge plant? So I'm thinking it was possibly either the, um, the Eremophila cowberry carpet, ground cover 
uh, Eremophila, or it might have been the silver cushion bush, uh, which is a form of Leucophyta brownii. We also had the, the canal rocks form on one of those slides, of the canal rocks form of the Leucophyta. Okay, um, so uh, ideal the percentage for ideal soil. So we're talking about that holy grail, that loamy soil. That ideal percentage was um, forty percent sand, forty percent silt, and twenty percent clay um, to create a, a good sandy loam, create a loam situation. Um, so getting kind of close to that would be would be great. You'll probably need to buy the clay in and you can buy that at most garden centres and hardware stores. It's generally sold as bentonite clay or kaolin clay and you need to mix that in with your organic soil improver, which you can also buy by the bag or by the trailer load. Um, website resources for garden design. So yes, head to the Bay OK Geocatch website. There is so many wonderful resources there for you. Um, and there's gonna be videos as well coming up with lots more tips too. Um, why do people um, cut, cut off their grass tree canopy? Good question. So, um, from what I can gather, generally it's an aesthetic decision um, to expose the blackened trunk. Um, some people even burn their grass trees and I don't recommend that at all. Um, a, it's a fire hazard and B, it can really stress your grass tree uh, and may even kill it. So don't burn it. Um, there's a company near me that have patented a, a paint that they apply to the grass tree trunk and it's a black food grade um, paint so they can blacken the trunk for that look if, if you wanted it so don't burn them um, but otherwise if you've got lots of wildlife in your garden then you know learn to be okay with a little bit of a shaggy skirt on your grass tree because it is a valuable habitat zone and I, I have seen um, quenders and other critters living under that skirt so if it's for a habitat garden, then leave it long. If you're looking for that contemporary look, then consider how you might paint it black rather than, than burn it, uh, the trunk that is. Um, is dichondra a replacement for grass? So dichondra works really well in shady areas. So yes, in a shady area, dichondra is an excellent no-mow lawn substitute, but it doesn't want full sun. So it will need protection, it will need shade. It probably doesn't cope with salt either. So choose appropriately. Lippy is another option. Um, just need to check the weed status in your area. Lippia grows very well and is another no-mow lawn substitute that can take the sun. Um, or you might experiment with things like ground cover thyme for small areas or ground cover oregano. There's lots of options. Um, and there's certainly some low growing native ground covers like myoporum for non-traffic areas. So if we're just foot, um, stepping stones through an area, then myoporum is an excellent ground cover that gives you that green lawn-like look, um, but in a ground cover. Can I recommend designers in the area with Bay OK principles? So that's a really good question for Bay OK. So I would send that question through. Um, I'm sure they would have a list of landscapers, uh, landscape designers that they can recommend. Um, otherwise, there's plenty of designers um, in, the, in the Perth metro area that would, would happily travel. Uh, another comment here, peppermint trees can be invasive in the garden. So. Um, I think that that depends on, on you know, where you are and certainly um, a peppermint tree is quite a big tree. So you need to think carefully about what large trees you're bringing into your garden. There's plenty of smaller trees that might you know, fit the bill for you. But if they're existing, then I would absolutely work with them. Look at what ground cover, look at what understory plants you can put underneath any existing peppermint trees because it takes 30, 40 years for them to become mature. So a mature tree is, is gold, absolute gold. Um, ground, which ground covers are pet friendly and which ones are not? So one that is not pet friendly, um, 
but does provide good habitat would be something prickly like the Hemiandra pungens, which is the snake, um, snake bush ground cover. It feels like a pin cushion. It's really sharp and prickly, but looks beautiful and lush and green with these gorgeous purple uh, or white flowers on it. So if you wanted a deterrent plant to keep pets out of the garden area then that would be a good one to look at. Um, other pet friendly ground covers, well the Myoporum's great, um, the Grevillea, uh, Grevillea Gingian Gem is an excellent low spreading ground cover as is the Grevillea Royal Mantle, there's a great um, Banksia ground cover, um, lots and lots of options there for you, soft foliage ones, one of my favourites, the yellow buttons um, with a silvery leaf and the yellow button flowers, Scavola, very pet friendly, has the fan flower, purple, pink or white, most commonly the purple, um, and one, one plant will spread one metre easily and it's very low and will take occasional light traffic, um, not regular traffic. Any tips on creating a garden? that reflects nature. So take photos of those natural scenes that appeal to you and, and you know, kind of break it down. What is it that, that draws your eye that appeals to you? Um, you can absolutely emulate nature. So, um, you know, whether it's local bush area, um, natural garden, even, you know, looking at King's Park is some really good inspiration there on natural landscapes. Um, and then it's just choosing those plants. And there's some great starting points on the website with those plant listings. Um, or, you know, take photos of those plants in the bush and then go into your local garden centre and say, what is this plant? What have I got here? You know, do you sell it? Because um, not all plants that are in our bush are available for sale, but more and more, more so. So um, more questions. Do, do all coastal plant species grow more happily in improved soils? So I would argue that cultivated plants, plants that you're buying from the nursery, from the garden centre, they've been accustomed to greater nutrition, good, better soil, regular watering. So yes, um, those coastal species still want soil improving. Some local coastal species that you know perhaps they've been um, purchased from a revegetation type nursery seeds that have been harvested from the area and only licensed professionals can harvest seeds from nature um, to grow only under license so those plants coastal plants locally harvest grown from seed might be a bit more tolerant of poor sandy coastal soils but Generally speaking, nursery plants, garden centre plants, they're all going to need some soil improver uh, at planting time and I would suggest clay as well. Uh, another question, bricky sand soil, a couple of metres down, plants die when they reach this area, can it be overcome? So most plants, the crucial area that we're looking at to improve is the feeding root zone, which is the top 30, 40 centimetres. So if we've improved that area for most ground covers and low shrubs, that should be adequate, particularly if we've added clay to hold and bind the soil improver and the nutrient in that soil profile. Obviously dig a bit bigger hole if you're planting a feature tree. I like to dig a metre by a metre hole um, there. So, you know, if you come across any of that compacted bricky sand as you're digging, then, you know, then do pull that out. Um, um, or try and mix the good stuff in with it. What native ground covers like shade? Well, the scavola, which will grow in the full sun, also tolerates shade as does the Myoporum, um, common name is Creeping Bubalia. Um, there's a ground cover version of the lemon-scented Darwinia, Darwinia citrudora prostrate. There's a ground cover version of the native Daphne, um, Philotheca, Cascade of Stars, and these all cope with some shade as well. Um, Dampiera likes shade too. Um, so there's a few native ground covers that you can look at there. 
how would you treat weeds in a mulched area? Well, personally, um, I'm all for looking at natural solutions for treating weeds. So um, you could look at boiling water on the weed. You could look at hand pulling. You could look at, and in my own garden, I just cut them down and, and, and sheet mulch um, on top. You could look at things like the eco-friendly weed killers, such as the... Um, there's an acetic acid and sodium chloride mix, which is basically vinegar and salt. And that will burn the leaves of your plants. There is also a, a weed killer that's based on a geranium um, plant extract. So it's a, a geranium pelagonic acid, um, nanoic acid. It's sold as slasher. And that you could use... Uh, but you'd need to apply it just to the weeds, as with the vinegar and salt combo as well, just on the weeds, as it would kill um, any plant that it touches. So there's a few things you can look at there. Steam is the other option that a lot of local councils are using to treat weeds. Uh, where can you go for a list of fire retardant plants? Well, um, I can help with that. So that might be something now. And just to reiterate too, with fire retardant plants, I do need to let you know that, you know, there's no such thing as a fireproof plant. Everything will burn in a fire situation. But what we're looking at is plants that perhaps burn slower whether it's by virtue of more water content in their leaves, um, plants that aren't full of volatile oils that, you know, when they burn, they spark, they pop, they, they really go off. So, um, so looking at plants that, that slow down the fire and there are listings of those. So I'm happy to send through what information I've got on file if you want to drop an email request there. Um, another question, um, environmentally friendly edging. So um, that's an interesting, interesting phrasing. So whether you're using reclaimed products, salvaged products, salvaged timbers that are not treated with, um, with chemicals, copper and arsenic and all those horrible things. So, um, so looking at um, timbers and in, in, in timber in that regard, I'd be looking at a very well aged timber that's already, you know, aged. So reclaimed salvaged timbers might be useful for edging using stone. Stone is great for creating little habitats for insects and invertebrates. Um, you might, I quite, I'd rather like using um, recycled brick um, and perhaps even using the core 10 steel. So looking at some of those other options, so many options that are available to us now with edging. Um, are fish ponds bay friendly? Absolutely. And I probably should have mentioned that. So thank you. Having a fish pond um, in the garden, creating a kind of a, a climate in the garden where, where fish, where frogs um, thrive um, is, is wonderful because um, having frogs, they're your natural pest control as well, eating mosquito larvae, um, eating other small um, grubs and um, slugs and um, so really helpful in the garden having having a diversity of, of animals and that water source is is crucial so frog ponds are great when you're designing a frog pond the best tip is to look at where in the property it's already naturally low where you've got any depressions on the property low points in the property that's a logical place to place a frog pond it'll look like it's always meant to be there using some rocks and stones around it places where other creatures can take a drink, um, but also um, leave the pond safely. Sticks across bird bars and ponds also for the bees are really important. Um, so many wonderful questions. And if I don't get to them all, then I will respond on um, uh, Facebook later on or through email later on. Um, what, um, how do we control kaikuyu? My goodness me, that's a tough one. You want to try and get it out of the garden area before you install your new garden. Um, now, whether it's using some of those eco-friendly weed killers to, to treat it, um, also getting in there with, with pitchfork or a small digger and dig up the roots as much as you can um, and then treat anything that comes through afterwards. Um, sheet mulching is, is how I've been tackling it as well in my 
my garden. So layering damp newspaper um, over winter weeds and other weeds and then putting mulch on top and, and topping that up. And, and we've really resolved that um, in our property. Um, do we have time for one, one more? Got a couple more questions there. Um, do, do peppermint trees encourage mosquitoes and possums? Well, um, I don't think peppermints encourage mosquito, but maybe there's a damp area nearby which the peppermints wouldn't mind, but might also be breeding ground for mosquito. Um, mosquitoes and flies and things tend to be repelled by um, highly aromatic plants. So I don't think the peppermint is an attractant as such, but is it a possum? Does it encourage possums? Well, it's it probably a habitat for possums. So, um, you know, possums need places to live. Um, and if we don't want them in our, in our roofs, then maybe having possum shelters, possum boxes. The problem we've got is we're pulling down too many of our beautiful old established trees, particularly when they have these dead sections hollowed out. It takes so many years for trees to form hollows. And then we come along and go, oh, there's a dead limb, we'll cut it off. And there goes another creature's home. So we need to be okay with a little bit of imperfection um, in our properties and, and cherish our, our old trees and, and, and creating these spaces where, where creatures can live and nest. Um, so, you know, I'm okay with, with, we've got a possum on our property at the moment. I'm okay with that. It's not eating anything. It's, it's just, it's just living. So um, looking for shrubs, um, one metre uh, and ground covers. So um, some really great things on your listings there. Some things I can think of straight away. Um, oh, grevilleas are one of my favourites, bringing the birds. They'll be looking at some low grevilleas. Uh, thank you. Shady area, looking for shrub, ah, side of the house, full shade, looking for shrubs, one metre and ground covers. So for that area, I'd be thinking about the Couriers, these are the native fuchsias. Um, they have the most amazing bell flowers, um, colours ranging from green um, with a sort of chef's cap type shape to it, white coria with a silvery leaf, and lots of beautiful red and um, peach, um, pink um, colours coming through. And they love the shade, they're really good for the shade. Um, things like the Darwinia, the lemon scented Darwinia, is also excellent um, and fits the shape there. There's a native mint bush, Prostanthera little minty, which would be great and is about a metre high, works well in the shade. And don't forget the native Daphnes, the Philothecas, um, used to be called Ariostomon, so you might find it under both names. Excellent for a metre high and shady gardens. And, um, we've, yep, done that one. Okay. Uh, yes, so I think we've... We've got through those questions. If you've got any other burning questions you want to ask, please send them through. We would love to love to hear them, love to answer those for you. And um, do remember at the end of this session, you'll get your link to the evaluation form um, to complete. We would love to hear your feedback um, and what other workshops you'd like to see perhaps. So uh, when you fill out your evaluation form, you do have the chance of going into the draw to win some garden goodies. So, um, so please, Please um, take a couple of minutes to fill that out and give us some of your feedback. So thank you and um, awesome to speak with you tonight. Enjoy your gardening experience and creating um, beautiful, sustainable, water-wise Bay OK Gardens. <laughs>